extrasensory perception, psychic phenomena, the varieties of such puzzling events present in virtually every culture are endless. And a controversial field called parapsychology has formed to examine these claims scientifically. If you can read minds, see the future, or sense unusual things, you are no doubt a believer. But critics, who call themselves skeptics, assert that ESP and psychic phenomena are meritless pseudoscience that take advantage of an uncritical media and a gullible public. Parapsychology, according to skeptics, should be debunked. Next, on Closer to Truth, what is parapsychology? Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm Robert Kuhn. Is parapsychology a new science or an old fraud? We've brought together world-renowned parapsychologists and skeptics. They joust and we judge. Dr. Dean Radin is an experimental psychologist who studies extrasensory perception, ESP. Dr. Charles Tart is a parapsychology pioneer, a spiritual seeker, and the author of numerous books on ESP. Dr. Barry Beierstein is a professor of neuropsychology and a regular contributor to the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Dr. Marilyn Schlitz is an anthropologist and experimental parapsychologist. And Dr. James Treffel is a professor of physics and a public commentator on science. Dean, your new book, The Conscious Universe, claims to give the scientific truth of psychic phenomena. Is science and psychic phenomena compatible, or is psi just wishful thinking and uh, old superstitions? Well, science consists of, of two general areas. There's the, the act of measurement, which is the empirical side of science, and then there's the theoretical side. When, when people ask questions about, is this scientific, they're almost always thinking about the theoretical side. And it's true that we don't have very good theories about psychic phenomena, but on the measurement side, it's very clear that scientific method can be brought to bear on these phenomena. We're going to see how very clear in the next 30 minutes. Charles, you've been a parapsychologist for 40 years. Can you describe the field and give some sense of its import for human understanding? Parapsychology is our modern name for what was originally called psychical research, and it started happening in the last century when there was so much conflict between science and religion, and science seemed to be explaining more and more of the world and maybe throwing out religion totally. But some people thought, is religion all nonsense? Could we apply the method of science, which has worked so well in the physical mm. sciences, to the area of strange, unusual happenings that are associated with religion and find out if there's actual fact there, not just superstition? Parapsychology is the modern evolution of that. Barry, you're a neuroscientist and a skeptic. I know neuroscience, that you study the brain. What is a skeptic? A skeptic is someone who demands reasonable evidence and reasonable logic to back up truth claims. And so I wouldn't uh, uh, call parapsychology uh, pseudoscience as long as they use the same uh, controls, the same techniques, the same mathematical and statistical procedures that uh, are used within science. So we can mm, disagree about the adequacy of the evidence, and that's what I am skeptical about. But uh, I don't uh, claim that it's all fraud or all pseudoscience. It, it's the amount of evidence and the availability of that evidence for skeptics to check that's at issue. We're going to give you some evidence right now. Marilyn, your director of research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, could you describe your most compelling experiments where senders influenced at a distance the physiological response of receivers? Well, we were interested in taking claims made by healers cross-culturally that somehow they were able to influence the physiology of people at a distance under conditions where the person didn't even know they were being influenced. And this is very difficult to do in a, in a field setting. So we moved into the laboratory and we 
monitored autonomic nervous system activity, that part of our physiology that functions automatically. Automatic, like heart rate, breathing, That's right. skin uh, response rate. So I would invite you into the lab, and I would monitor, for example, I'm nervous your, already. <laughs> well, that'll help. Okay, we can calm you. Um, so we would monitor your galvanic skin response, for example. The, the same, electrical activity of my skin. Right? Exactly. The same measurement they use for lie detectors. Mm. And we would I'm then... I'm not coming near you. Ah, you got something to hide, do you? We know. Um, <laughs> so what we would do is Can ask you to seats? sit in one room while we're monitoring your physiology, and we would invite a healer to come in, and in a distant room where there is no sensory contact between the two of you, we would ask them to randomly attempt to influence your physiology at a distance. So, for example, they would try to calm you psychically. Um, and then we would compare your autonomic nervous system activity during these uh, intentionality periods as compared to control periods. And I wouldn't know when they're doing exactly. it. Exactly. You have no idea when these influence periods are. They're randomly distributed across the session. And we have now compiled about 40 experiments that are set up under this kind of protocol. And overall, the results are highly compelling. Uh, there are strong statistical data to support the idea that there's some kind of exchange of information between two people, even under conditions where there's no sensory And you've had non-believers, skeptic, auditing the experimental design and, and the work and the statistical analysis, right? Oh, the most recent experiments I've done are with uh, a professor from England, Richard Wiseman, who's a card-carrying member of the skeptical community, and who is very interested in trying to do experiments together, where the first project we did in his lab under his conditions, um, same equipment, same randomization procedures, same subject population, everything was identical except that I worked with half the people and he worked with half the people. And we both replicated our initial findings. I got an effect and he didn't. Uh, this was very compelling to us in terms of what the intentionality or the, the expectations of the researcher might have to bear on the results. We then invited Richard to come over to my lab, set up the same experiment in my laboratory, and replicated the effect a second time. So it suggests not only is there an effect, but that it can happen under conditions where skeptics and proponents work together, and that there is some way in which the belief systems or expectations yeah. of the researcher come to play. Jim, you're a physicist. One of your many books is 101 Things You Don't Know About Science. Did you include parapsychology in your list? Uh, no, what that was was a sort of a, a tour of the frontiers of science as the, uh, at the end of this century. Why didn't you include parapsychology? Well, one of the things I, I wanted to, I mean, one of the uh, criteria I used was that uh, if something was going to be included, that there had to be some reasonable expectation that, that it would be the questions would be answered in the uh, foreseeable future. And parapsychology has been around, uh, uh, as has been said, for over a century. I don't see a resolution coming anytime soon, so I didn't include it. Okay. Dean, take us through the categories of parapsychology. People know mental telepathy. They know uh, influencing uh, dice or something. But or organize it for us briefly. Well, there, there are four classic categories that are studied. One is telepathy, as you've said. Uh, another is clairvoyance. T telepathy meaning mind reading to mind. minds. Well, reading is not quite right Sorry. because it's, it, it sounds like thoughts are being perceived and this mm -hmm. virtually never happens. But more that there, there's a mind to mind connection. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. feeling and form, that kind of thing seems mm -hmm. to, to pass. Uh, clairvoyance, which is getting information from a distance either in space or time and precognition, which is then a subset of that, but specifically getting information through time. Uh, so, so clairvoyance would be without another mind involved that you perceive something that you couldn't know through the senses, but no other mind knows it. So you're not reading, sorry for the term reading, but you're not under perceiving somebody else's mind, but you're perceiving an event or an occurrence. Right, which is either hidden, as in an envelope, for example, or at a distance, so your normal senses would not see it, mm -hmm. uh, or it is displaced in time. Mm -hmm. And then a, a fourth category... The displaced in time being precognition. Precognition yeah. or retrocognition. Right. That there's okay. some event somewhere that is either, it is not now, it's, it's in the future or in the past. Okay. And then the fourth category is uh, psychokinesis, which in the vernacular is mind over matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, so in, within those four classes so of experiments... what's a classical mind over matter type of uh, experience? Well, in, in the old days, uh, gamblers would claim